Welcome back. Let's get into it. We're going to talk about uh, this area. I've been talking about Sage Wall and things with relationship to my research. Adding my research's angle of analyzing the details. At this point, I've established that it was etched by the flood. Okay, so now it occurred to me. I've made all these magnetic anomaly Google Earth map overlays to kind of go back and forth between the two that I should probably do one here. So let's go ahead and um, it's real quick. I did this. So here's Bighorn Mountain mountains, but mountain in some way and that it's just this huge mass here. And around it, I don't know if this is so true right here, it's kind of got some data meshing between layers where they're like across here. The map itself is like that, like two different things are being like merged into one image. So I just kind of drew that thinking, well, maybe. But besides that, like we can follow this around here, around there, over here, around here generally, around this way, and then it goes out past this one to over here, over this way, around again, also goes off this way, so around again though, and off that way, over here, and then from over here, if we just follow it, there's this, so over here pretty much along this region, uh, also, like here, so like this spiral doesn't just go in, it also goes out this way. So this creates like a channel. Whether or not it's an in inlet or an outlet, unclear, but it's certainly there. And then if we just keep following the spiral low, uh, it effectively stops there, but then it has like an outer spiral that um, is what the rest of this is. And certainly more to it than I drew, like over here maybe, uh, this here, maybe here is like a hard boundary of an ammonite spiral. <clears throat> so um, up here, an, an outlet there, I'm going up that way. So there's, or inlet, there's like, to me like, what are we doing? Why is my research being ignored when Things like this are not known. Science doesn't know this. Also over here, going up that way, but probably up there as well. Science is utterly oblivious to this spiral's presence. So I thought I'd overlay. Here, here's the map. Sage wall is up here. I added this segment especially after yesterday, realizing Gem Lake is like where this straight path bends. That's where Gem Lake is. I'd happen to stumble on it when looking for videos yesterday. Um, and it couldn't, I couldn't have stumbled on a better place, honestly. Like if it had been like over here, maybe I wanted to have even, I mean, along the path is good. It's probably along the path other places too, but at that exact, like, deflection point, inflection point, the, the bend, at the bend is Gem Lake. Clearly related to this, where this is just in the terrain itself. So if we go here, essentially here's the backbone, this, this, strong current coming through here when the earth was expanding and this material was being accreted on. So let's go to that one real quick. This, when all this was being accreted onto North America up here, it narrowed a channel in the ocean currents so that it got pinched and went this way with a high velocity. And um, didn't just bend like this here interacts with the earth creates the Colombian river basalt as well as the Missoula flood and uh, interacts with the I think I called it in the past the Gandalf staff kind of thing 
you shall not pass. Like, it prevents the flow of this pass there. So it holds a boundary, this down here, which is in this image better, here, which is basically between the pink lines, generally a current. So let's go to the earth. A current coming out of this, I believe, literally, out of the earth, water coming out of this region that then flowed this way, ran into resistance from currents over here, water over here, and pinched it and then bent up this way held a boundary there goes straight through here through here to there pretty much and then maybe continues across there somewhere i don't know whereas uh the bottom side goes to the sierra nevada i believe it's called um and just holds this boundary and forms this snake head up here that is then visible here. Creates the Bonville Flood, the Colorado Plateau is forming, the Triple Junction forms there, to the west of it. All this stuff going on. But this current from the backbone comes through, through Flathead Reservation Lake, Reservation Region, and goes through here around this like divides around and both ways around and then continues straight like it just continues straight through here especially i'm not sure why it's not so visible here maybe this was overwritten with like yellowstone related stuff that made it more subtle between here that there was a path that just goes and goes all the way over here. And then probably comes in here and bends and doesn't actually go out here, but comes in, runs into resistance, pinches just like down in Mexico, pinches the material of the earth to make the uh, laramide orogeny or participate in, in, its, in its formation. Flows over here, flows down here, flows down here, flows out here, and then goes, because it's running into this current, it just deflects off it and goes along this far boundary. I guess it still goes in the opposite direction here, generally, but it went along the boundary to do that. And, pro and probably went this way. Like, probably went this way. Although it's not as visible in the terrain, and uh, just join this current, possibly some kind of like across to this circle here that I think is on this map. This orange, like this orange, possibly goes that way and that way, but also across the center nucleus of this orange part. <clears throat> One second. So yeah, this this region though that's coming up, the current coming up this way with this width goes into the Great Basin and goes up to Sage Wall. Here's Sage Wall, goes up generally to like up here and then back this way generally. So it participates in causing a resistance in this region. So when this current comes through, it runs into resistance, probably leading even to the formation of this, like, this nub, literally, it's like a large-scale nub, that's just huge. And then that current gets into the center and etches out the center, but then it continues on in the direction it was traveling through the, through the whatever this is, animal-wise, deer, not deer, but antelopes, whatever this is with like a long horn-looking thing that I 
like to associate to animals because currents induce repetitive structures that certain animals in like they indicate the structure of the current it's not just for the sake of like oh it looks like one let's call it one <laughs> but then it goes through here and across here as well as out here this side to the south and out this way and over here but like pressures that way so it gets encouraged along the boundary that way through here over that way so that's going on here's bighorn mountain which is really my focus right now even though i haven't really talked about it in a while and i don't even know what i'm gonna say really i just made these thought i'd share them so that's that, and then there's this one, where the, here's the currents again. Here's the, this current going straight through. Like, I don't even think I was thinking, I wasn't thinking about Sage Wall at this point. Wasn't even part of my considerations when drawing this. I, I assume I drew a current coming up this way, there it is. I guess I didn't draw it all the way up to the purple, but all the way up to the purple. <coughs> So these are currents going on. This this one also extends in the, in these colors over here to hold the boundary. So it's holding the boundary. Also, this one spirals and maybe even has like a boundary to us here to in regard to ammonites forming at the ends ends of ammonites. Even though I'm pretty sure the end of this ammonite really is Greenland. It's like the final chamber of the ammonite structure. So this is going on. Okay. But like, this is going on. So I thought I'd look at it and we're gonna talk about it now because we're finally through all the introduction to this one where I just do what I did with the other ones, fade in and out. I really think it's pretty good. Like if we look at this corner here, it's pretty good. We can see the magnetic anomaly outline coming in. It's a little off slightly, but it's pretty good. Like the the boundary up there, uh, let's see. It's a little off, definitely off a little bit, but if we follow the coastline, like that's really good, the coastline. Down to here, if we look at this line below the Juan de Fuca, so this is pretty well overlaid. Here's Bighorn and and Bighorn. So like that's overlaid. So I, I basically hinged this here and then tried my best to align the left side and called it a day. So there's probably some discrepancy in the maps, but I think it's pretty solid. So let's just look around and see what we can glean from just going back and forth. So, here's Bighorn, but then here is where Devil's Tower is, which interestingly is just beyond the boundary, pretty much, of, of the ring. This is the center, that's just beyond the boundary. If we go over to Yellowstone, it's beyond this boundary over here in this region. It's almost like a chamber of the Ammonite of the Bighorn mountain spiral around it that goes all the way out there <clears throat> and then if we look at this there it is we can see that this channel that flow is going here and building compressing masses i guess probably flowing above and below the like on both sides like down this way and then below it and pushing upward while this is coming in and pushing downward to just kind of squeeze a uh, relatively high magnetic anomaly strip, a strip out of it. So that's going on. Like we can see uh, this strip is closely related to the terrain, which is good. Here's this, this head face, this, this somber face which we can see the bottom boundary is pretty well 
in line with um, the magnetic anomalies there. So it's kind of just lodged in this spot. And then if we look at the mountains, this is interesting, the mountains are actually kind of abutting the magnetic anomalies, but not atop them. They're like running into the magnetic anomalies. Like this is compressed by pressures that build the magnetic anomalies, but then the mountains form like against the magnetic anomalies. Seemingly, like pressures over here just generally pushed material into resistance that then is associated with the magnetic anomalies. If we look over here as well, like they're generally like within a blue region where there's low intensity. Uh, here's Vancouver. goes across that way which is pretty much in line with that so this thing right across the eyes is in line with with um like a connection back to this yellowstone and bighorn you can see there like there the, the little the eyes are below so let's see right there so maybe above like the eyebrow is uh, some sort of, I call it in the past, the magnetic field of Yellowstone, the way it is, very reminiscent of um, the angel, the angel. Do I not have it here? I guess not. There it is of this, of this side, relative to this side, where this is like a figure eight flow that forms two like varied lobes. They're not the same structurally, but they're generally like opposite sides of this bulk mass here. It's also maybe like a nub. Like if we look at um, Sage Wall, at the at the nubs, like the I talked about this in the last video, the crack in the nubs. as well as the splitting rock and that being a knob that split because it did something of this nature. Maybe there's a relationship to how this is producing a current out this way that then spreads out, but like maybe this type of mechanic is at play when it comes to producing like a divide, like a jet stream just a thought, okay. Um, let's just keep looking. What else? So the Rockies are over here. You can see in the magnetic anomaly map as well as like where the Laramide orogeny is in this little region here. That's kind of got all these specks of really low magnetic intensity relative. That current just cuts right across there. So that has, interestingly, oh, there's a magnetic anomaly generally below that. Is that the Tetons? I'm not sure what that is. Tetons might be over here. Whatever that is. It's so hard to remember all names. So many names, so many things. I mean, and they're not named. Like, if you, it's you gotta like search it out and know how to find the names and get lucky. Sometimes, if you don't. Anyway, um, what else? So this area though is it's kind of in, incredible. Like this, this ring around Bighorn Mountain extends all the way up here. Like it's 
really maybe I'm thinking to like here in reality in terms of the precise location where this is and then maybe the far side goes to the top of this it's huge it's huge we have no concept that this is there it goes all the way well now we do but we didn't Let's see, down here. So it goes, this is also interesting, where the bottom of this ring is, is really where the Colorado Plateau begins. That's interesting, that's like right at this corner is this structure. That might be like an area there. And then to the north it goes, to around there, to the east it goes past Devil's Tower, really to over here, so where's that? Around where this snot from the nose is or something? <laughs> and to the west, to past Yellowstone, basically to the Idaho Batholith. Here's the Idaho Batholith. Notice below it, high, a very low magnetic anomaly. It's almost like it's like lifted and there's a void underneath it. The flow went below it, lifted it up, and then solidified it to be held up as it is stably enough that there's a chamber below it, a space for current to flow. Maybe it's the final chamber. I think if there's chambers around the ammonite that seemingly has a like chakra at Bighorn Mountain. Also see, kind of, especially in the water, in the river there, and over there, like a continuous thing, so let's see. Let's see where that is, starting over there, over that way. It's right there. So it's... A, starting like it's got a gap this the magnetic anomaly mass there it looks like it literally spaced the current one goes along this side the other goes over here it 
runs, I guess, runs into resistance bends this way. Swirls around. Oh my god. So I was thinking maybe it would be useful. I have not really looked at this yet to consider um, this in regard to what we're looking at. Like, right here was Sulawesi and the Philippines. So really, the Philippines were very related to what's going on at Bighorn Mountain. I don't think they had spaced yet. Uh, maybe to a degree they started to move apart. But something going on, almost like maybe... Generally, there's a current coming in from uh, Asia that another current runs into and maybe bends under over that way to make, like, to flow in here and wrap around in as well as maybe wrap around and out from, like, a one point. It comes in. I think this is a thing that happens by the way, which is partially why they tend to break, is it doesn't just like come in at the, at the center or at the very end of the structure, it actually comes in the middle and a portion spirals in and forms the innards of the ammonite spiral and another portion spirals out and forms the outer portion so they can form almost like two separate units relatively that are more able to break apart due to that mechanic. Uh, it's possible something of that nature is going on where there's both spiral in and spiral out and a current coming in this way, being drawn in to the center. <clears throat> and at some point, like, Bighorn Mountain formed at the KT boundary. If we go to Google Scholar, Bighorn Mountains Geology. Maybe this one, because it's got a PDF. Like is it, this is happening at, as the crescendo of pressure building builds and builds and builds crescendo KT boundary, which Bighorn Mountain is uplifted. So let's see what this says. Crystalline core of the Bighorn Mountains and compare the exhumation history derived from those ages with the exhumation history determined from sedimentary rocks in the adjacent Powder River and Bighorn Basins. Uh, range from 62 to 369 million years and represent a pre-Laramide helium, I guess, partial retention zone that was deformed and uplifted at, basically, the KT boundary. Now this says plus or minus 5 million, but that's under the premise that 5 million years, according to geology, is actually 5 million years when it's not. So it's much closer. 65 million was only like 10,000 years ago, something of that nature, much closer to present than 65 million. So, so too is like 60 million and 70 million. They're much closer to one another. It's just... A lot of things are happening, and rapid radioactive decay is occurring, painting a picture of the apparentness of millions of years when we use modern rates of radioactive decay as a basis to calculate, and when we have a desire to have the Earth be millions of years old so that the Bible can just be disproven, and there's a lot of atheism, like driving 
like beliefs that the Bible is invalid, driving this conclusion to be made with certainty as if it's true when it's not true. Also, Big Horn Mountain. This is Big Horn, like Amon, Amon, like Amon. God, Amon, Amon, Big Horn. I don't know why that one doesn't have a horn on it. Sorry, guys, I have no money. <laughs> I'd be happy to help if I could. Because Wikipedia is pretty much necessary in the world. Like, if you imagine a world without Wikipedia, like, what are we going to do? Someone's got to come up with a new one? Like, come on. We just got to make sure that this... And it's almost like a service to the public. It's just allowed to exist by people supporting it. Like, like those responsible for governments... Like, their decision-making should include, like, let's make sure that things like this can exist, and also let's not let's control it because we're not tyrants. Or be tyrants, I guess, if you want, whatever. But point being, Bighorn is aptly named, dudes. <laughs> it only occurred to me... When I was doing this, I was like, you know, it's really well named. <laughs> it's a huge horn, big horn. That's one big horn. Maybe it should have been called huge horn or gigantic horn mountain, um, infinite horn mountain, something like. Let's go back to this, though. What else is going on? Preservation of the pre-Laramide partial retention zone in the upper few hundred meters of Precambrian basement indicates that, in general, the temperature at the Cambrian unconformity did not exceed the apatite helium closure temperature, meaning helium gets retained. Like, if it reaches enough of a high temperature, the helium within like can like boil off maybe not boil but like be extracted from the material and apparently it didn't happen it's difficult to reconcile with evidence from adjacent basins where thick set of sequences of sedimentary rocks almost like a ring of sediment around the nucleus of the galaxy like a galaxy has a nucleus of a large system and then around it are subtler systems just like that the sediment surrounds this nucleus and has a weird anomaly where difficult to reconcile with evidence for a thick sequences of sediment rocks prior to 65 and normal modern geothermal gradients not sure what exactly that means in terms of like translating it to my research and the significance of what they're saying uh, either the range was never deeply buried two to three kilometers its geothermal gradient has been low less than 20 degrees c since at least the mesozoic which is far before 70, 60 million. Like, when's the Mesozoic? Like, 252, okay. 266, so like, to it, but I imagine they're saying since at least 252 million. Or our appetites have higher uranium thorium helium closure temperatures than those measured for others that's interesting bighorn mountains are one of the easternmost laramide ranges uh, precambrian crystalline cr rocks crop out 
over much of the core of the range. The northern part of the range core is characterized by 2.85 plus or minus 0.03 billion year granitoids, and other in the southern part by 2.95 billion uh, Nisic lithologies. Near the margins of the range, these basement rocks are over. The, so, like, it's, this is basically something that was deep down in the layers that then the earth expanded and it pushed it up. So, it's like composed of things that are old in part. Here is the core, I guess. Although, uh, it does seem like it also was like swirling in the eddy to compress it. So, it does have a bit of an, an anomaly to be, to me, that it, it would be easier if this just said, like, Mesozoic to the 66 million kind of time frame. But uh, it doesn't mean every single thing I've ever said is wrong. <laughs> Near the margins of the range, basement rocks are overlain by Cambrian, so overlain through tertiary sedimentary rocks that dip down, which, which tertiary, I believe, is like 66 to present, to 2.6. So overlain by Cambrian, so basically, since Cambrian is when the Earth started to expand, through uh, when it basically stopped. So then there's all these deposits of sediments, sedimentary rocks that dip toward and beneath the adjacent Powder River and Bighorn Basins. Where's Powder River to the east and west? Bighorn Basin, Powder River. Oh, I got some dates here. 62 to 75 in, in this point, and then 75 to 85 nearby, 85 to 95 further up. I guess there's some 75 to 85 up there as well, and maybe a couple others from the earlier even. I was just thinking it would be cool if it like spiraled in age-wise. There's certainly a tendency for the older things to be a little further north. And younger down here. In this map. Are uranium thorium helium ages define a fossil pre laramide helium partial retention zone and indicate that most of the basement exposed in the Bighorn Mountains has been colder than the appetite uh, closure, te closure temperature for all of the Phanerozoic time? The youngest ages in the partial retention zone suggest exhumation of the range around the KT boundary. Par variations in the magnetic or magnitude of exhumation can be inferred from differences in the elevation of any given age from the partial retention zone. KT boundary, if you haven't seen my events of the KT boundary part one and two, it would be a good thing to watch those if you're interested in what I'm talking about because it really drives home that the KT boundary is not caused by an impact caused by the earth expansion process when the crust that was under stress from the internal pressures building up from the vortex weapon known as an brahmastra that was used in ancient times in hindu scripture as described on particularly ancient dwarka i'm not completely sure they used what quote a brahmastra at that point, but it certainly is tied to the expansion of the Earth, so I want to, I imagine that's what was going on. Um, but they attack the Earth with a vortex weapon and cause ether to flow in, which then caused the Earth to 
begin to expand undercurrents below the crust of flow, which then started to run into each other and go up and down and cut into the crust to a point where the crust started to sever. 65 million is when the crust like fully severed so that the seven continents that we know today could form when they were a single landmass before the earth started to expand conjoin no boundaries as we see them the surface like different because the flood happened deposited a bunch of material eroded a bunch of material okay support a structural model so this is interesting that is low temperature there's a this low temperature aspect where Yellowstone presumably is high temperature aspect. So it's almost like positive negative, one's hard, dense, cold, that forms like a dense nucleus, where the other is hot and fluid, and they are like ex heat exchanging or something that, of that nature, where the presence of this, like, overall coldness helps like maintain the energetic bond to the really hot fluid uh, of Yellowstone's hotspot. That's the impression I get from this. Phanerozoic is as not spelled right whatsoever it is 541 to present so during the earth expansion process is when that is um these differences support a structural model for the bighorn mountains in which the basement is folded like currents flowing and causing folds along with its sedimentary cover presence of a fossil appetite helium partial retention zone in the Bighorn Basin basement to depths of 0.5 to 1 kilometer below the Cambrian unconformity requires one or more of the following prelaramide sedimentary cover over the basement was thinner than suggested by evidence from adjacent basements basins the geothermal gradient was extremely low Bighorn Mountains Appetites have lower helium diffusivity and therefore higher closure temperatures than Durango appetite. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, let me just do this so I can link that. Maybe see if one more sounds interesting. Crystal size on, and so influence of crystal size. This was from. 2002 this is 2001 so they're probably suggesting the crystal size plays a role in the temperature of the helium closure type stuff again where the other one didn't seem to specifically say something like that maybe in the text somewhere i don't know if they reference this paper or are aware of this paper but I guess we can see if they reference it by just going Reiner. Oh, it's them, so. <laughs> it's him and someone else that's not involved in this paper, so certainly he's aware. Okay, there it's referenced, okay. So what do they say? The interpretation that most of our appetite helium ages represent long-term Partial helium retention is supported by replicate analyses of aliquots from the same samples that show significant correlations between crystal size and helium. That's interesting. Okay, so that probably sums up this paper pretty well. <laughs> Since they're the authors, they probably can sum it up pretty well. Here we present crystal-sized correlated helium ages from coexisting appetites from the Bighorn Mountains, Wyoming, that range from 100 to 350 million. 
These correlations are a sensitive indicator of the rock's thermal history in a temperature range below the system's nominal closure temperature and are consistent with a thermal history involving residents in the upper two to three kilometer of the crust since the Precambrian. Another thing that just occurred to me, here's Bighorn Mountain, and there is an eddy over here that basically runs over here and down here and to Bighorn Mountain. So it's quite possible because this eddy is below a huge glacier that we've talked about in a bunch of episodes. Um, I think like the 250 range. These ones, these ones, this one, probably this one, this one, 250, yeah, 251, yeah, 250, 251, then 252, 253, probably 254, 255, maybe 256, I can't tell by the picture, it looks like maybe not, maybe like, I was really talking about this area throughout all of these videos, pretty much. Even this. This is important, the Trail of Zircons. Zircons are transported throughout North America in, like, odd ways that are, like, come on, guys. We gotta talk about these details. We can't just present to the public some narrative that doesn't account for the details that are known because it doesn't fit into the narrative, so we just simple, simplify it by just making false statements. This is the nature of the Earth, plate tectonics, blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. Which is not true, though. Like, there, it doesn't capture what was going on whatsoever. This is true. Maybe there's some nuance to it that I'm not picking up on that there's debatable, but, like, the gist of it is so... Okay, um, so maybe this cold, like, exchanged over here and just kept Bighorn Mountain cold, but then Yellowstone, formed over here and didn't even have, like, it didn't reach there, or is after the fact. It was definitely after the water started to drain into the ocean, so there might have the Yellowstone might just have happened after the uh, water had receded, so there was not really the heat exchange, so it was more able to just be hot and so on. Where Bighorn really, I guess, was just heat exchanging especially at a boundary like that's where a current flows most intensely is along the very boundary of the flow which is pretty much where bighorn is so it probably heat exchanged substantially with the eddy going on up here probably an aspect of why this is going on History of the rock, the rock's thermal temperature below 70 degrees C. Like, that's pretty low. Consistent with thermal history involving residents in the upper two to three kilometers of crust since Precambrian, with maximum temperatures of 65 to 80 degrees C just prior to Laramide orogenic exhumation. So temperature increased approaching the KT boundary, just not so much as to make this helium be like extracted from the crystals. Influence of crystal size on helium ages will be most apparent in rocks where temperatures have been in the range of partial helium retention for long periods of time. In such cases, accurate interpretation of uranium, thorium, helium ages must incorporate the effect of crystal size. Oh, 
I'm hoping that. Let's see. Another P. Geology of the Bighorn Canyon. This is a report. So it's probably not a paper. USGS. <clears throat> well, this is a book. Oh my god. Ain't nobody got time for that. Okay. Um that's good. Fifty minutes. I don't I don't wanna like end it immediately, but I also didn't wanna drag it on, so that's good. I have Shallagrams to talk about, I have Ammonites to talk about, we're gonna get back to that. I think I'm done talking about Sage Wall for the time being in that area unless something else comes up. Uh, but I feel I've conclusively proven and I can just move on that it was um, naturally formed by the flood, which is really supernatural because the flood was someone's um, doing someone's doing okay so see you guys next one peace out